Hello, my name is Philippe Jurand, a professor in the history department at McNeese State University. I'm Candy Thornton. And I'm Arturo Flores. I'm from the history department as well from McNeese. Welcome to Your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman. She is a renowned speaker and symbol of empowerment to women in her community. She started from the bottom working on a coffee plantation in Guatemala. And now she's selling out venues to preach tolerance around the world. Oh, and by the way, she got a Nobel Prize along the way. Her name is... Rigoberta Menchu. Along the way, we'll sample songs from Guatemala, the country of her birth, some of them sung by indigenous women. Some of them in Spanish, English, or even the Mayan languages. Let's start with some Guatemalan rap. Here's Poesia Venenosa by Rebecca Lane. This is Cypher Effect from Los Angeles. Rebecca Lane de Guatemala. Lamento mucho no cumplir con sus expectativas. Lo que pasa es que soy un poco conflictiva. Me motiva la polémica de las artes escénicas. Nadie corre el telón. Las butacas están llenas. Prenden la luz y solo se proyectan sombras. Nadie me nombra, pero salgo a la penumbra. Donde no alumbra el foco rojo del deseo. De verme interpretar un personaje que no creo. Como disfrutan aplaudiendo cuando con mis lágrimas le doy vida a todo el sufrimiento. Pescar palabras lo traigo de nacimiento, me las trago todas para escupir el sentimiento. No me anunciaron en ninguna cartelera, hace unos meses atrás era una muchacha cualquiera. Al verme en el espejo el corazón se me hizo piedra, es que mis serpientes se tragaron mucha hiedra venenosa. Poesía venenosa, por los poros sudo poesía venenosa. Nada tiene sentido si lo digo en el delirio Se termina la función, regálenme ramos de venenosa Poesía venenosa, por los poros sudo poesía venenosa Nada tiene sentido si lo digo en el delirio Se termina la función, regálenme ramos de Hoy tengo ganas de cantar incoherencias Feminista postmoderna de la eterna primavera Intento vivir del arte aunque realmente no quiera Me perdí en el tiempo y me equivoqué de era No es cualquiera la que se rompe la pierna en las tablas La que lastima su voz porque la acústica está mala En Guatemala con el alma astillada Antes de verme triunfar me tirarán una granada Para nada agradezco que critiquen mi fachada No me gusta andar sonriendo porque soy malhumorada Este hipócrita espectáculo de bajo presupuesto No tiene control moral ni hormonal por supuesto Les apuesto que no pagarán por esto Me criticarán porque no soy lo que quisieron Querían relajarse, no oír mi conflicto interno Para soportarme deberán comerse hiedra venenosa Poesía venenosa Bonjour and welcome back to You Grammar Rocks We just listened to Poesía Venenosa by Rebecca Lane Je m'appelle Philippe Girard I'm Candy Thornton and I'm Arturo Flores. Today we're exploring the life of Rigoberta Menchu. Our story begins on January 9th, 1959 in Chamel. Which would be in Guatemala, Central America. Correct. Uh, brought into this world by Juana and Vicente Perez, Rigoberta was not by any means born with a silver spoon in her mouth. So she wasn't born into royalty is what you're saying. Exactly. She was part of the Quiche Mayan tribe, an indigenous people to Guatemala who relied on their coffee crops for survival. The Mayans were the people who built all those famous pyramids like Quichen Itza in Mexico and Tikal in Guatemala. Maybe you don't remember what they look like, but you do. They're the rebel base on Yavin 4 in the Star Wars movies. When we think of Native Americans in the U.S. today, we speak of a small minority that's been pushed to the margins of society. But they represent a much larger chunk of society in much of Latin America, especially in places like Bolivia and, for today, Guatemala. When it came to the coffee crop, it wasn't just adults because the kids were just as responsible and they had to pull their share of the workload on these plantations. Did she get any form of education while working on these plantation fields? This is one point of contention. She claims that she didn't go to school as her father feared she would lose her cultural identity. However, evidence has shown she has received some form of formal education. There are quite a few points of contention regarding her life, indeed. We've had that issue when dealing with women from 2,000 years ago for whom sources were few. 
Well, Rigoberta Menchu is very much from our time, and yet the sources are not in agreement either. So the search for truth is always a perilous one. We'll always need historians who know how to examine documents with a critical mind. So what happens after the plantations with Rigoberta? Well, before we move on from the plantations, a significant turn of events happened that set her destiny into motion. And what events are you talking about? Well, as a young woman, she elected to join a local women's rights group and started to live a life of activism. From there, she ended up linking up with the Catholic Church to advocate social reform within the region. So just to give a bit of background to our listeners, the 50s, 60s, 70s were a very political time in Guatemala. The country briefly lived under President Arbenz, who was a left-wing president who advocated land reform, including distributing land from the rich to poor indigenous families like the Manchus. Something bad happened to him, I assume. It seems like history is always about bad stuff. Well, you'd be right about that. Jacobo Arbenz was overthrown in 1954. Not just that, but it was a coup orchestrated by the CIA. Why was the U.S. meddling in Guatemala's affairs in the first place? Well, this was a Cold War, and Jacobo Arbenz was suspected of being pinkish or even red because of his land redistribution scheme. So President Eisenhower in the U.S. was afraid of the communists gaining a foothold in Central America. And where does the Catholic Church feature in all of that? Well, in reaction to social inequality in Latin America, some young priests began to advocate the, quote, theology of liberation, a liberal reading of the Gospels, which meant lobbying for the rights of Native Americans. So the Cold War was all around, even in church. This must have had a great impact on Rigoberta, I imagine. Yes, I believe it gave her something to believe in and gave her life purpose beyond just being an agricultural worker and working in the fields for the rest of her life. How did her family and colleagues react to her interest in activism? It must have been shocking, especially for that time period. I'm glad you brought that up because her family ended up taking action as well in their own ways. Can't wait to hear more, and we will, but we are coming up on our second song. We will have to go into more detail after the break and touch on her family getting into activism as well. Can't wait for that. Before that, let's continue with another political song by a Native American from Central America. Here is Hijos de la Tierra by Sara Kurochich.
Welcome back. I'm Arturo Flores, co-host of Your Grandma Rocks, your favorite women's history show on KBYS. I'm Candy Thornton. Et je suis Philippe Girard. We just listened to Hijos de la Tierra. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université Magnus. Prior to this song, we were discussing the life of Rigoberta Menchu, an activist for Native American rights in Central America. We had gotten to her family and how they played a role in activism and steering her into the path she took. So how is it that her parents impacted her activism? Well, you see, her family all took part in seeking out social reform, and this was a problem. How so? Well, with Guatemala's military-centric government. The one, as you recall, that had taken over after a 1954 coup against the democratically elected president, Jacobo Arbenz. So if that dictatorship was all about protecting the rights of rich Hispanic landowners from Native American peasants, I'm assuming they didn't enjoy Rigoberta and her family speaking out against them. Not at all. During this time, there were guerrilla organizations in the area fighting the Guatemalan government. Let's just say things popped off, with the Guatemalan government blaming Rigoberta's father and tying him to the guerrilla operations that were going on at the time. This cannot end well, I imagine. It didn't. Vicente supposedly died in a fire while protesting human rights violations by the Guatemalan military. Why the quotations around supposedly? Well, strap on your tinfoil hats, ladies and gentlemen, because... Let's not go into Alex Jones territory. This is a history broadcast. Well, I'm not normally into conspiracy theories, but when a political activist dies in suspicious circumstances under a military dictatorship, we're allowed to double-check the official story. It's not tinfoil stuff, just due diligence. Right. Long story short, but it's a little odd to me that the man who is protesting military violations of human rights just ends up dying in a fire. Point taken. But was there anything to suggest there may have been a foul play? Well, not with the father's death per se. However, several other events occur that raise suspicion. Such as? Such as Menchu's brother being kidnapped, tortured, and executed by the military. Wow. Then her mother was also kidnapped mutilated and raped before she was also murdered. Double well, that's a lot to handle. What did Rigoberta do in response? You can see why dying in a fire seems like foul play now. After these events, Rigoberta fled to Mexico around 1981. Uh, but I'd also like to address a point of controversy surrounding this period of her life. Okay, but first we're going to hear another song. We're still into pretty political stuff. This one is about children victims of the military conflicts in Central America. This is Como un Duende by Alux Nawal. Nacer nunca pidió, y al pedir nadie le dio. Su cuerpo son los huesos que la tierra se comió. El hambre y el dolor a él le sobran ya. Su mente es como un globo, vuela y vuela sin parar. Es como un duende, parece duende. Es niño sin infancia y sin pastel Es como un duende, parece duende Vive entre basura, no parece de verdad Aceras despertando sin soñar Él tiene siglos ya Y todo sigue igual Como es un niño pobre Su tristeza es muy normal Es como un duende Parece duende Niño sin infancia y sin pastel Es como un duende Bonjour à tous and welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks on KBYS. This was Como Un Duende. Je suis Philippe Girard. I'm Candy Thornton. And I'm Arturo Flores. Today we're covering the life of Rigoberta Menchu, a Native American woman from Guatemala, best known for taking on the military dictatorship that ruled her country from the 50s and 80s. Before the song, you wanted to address a point of controversy surrounding Rigoberta around the time of her family's murders. Yeah, there's a ton of controversy, and Rigoberta has come under scrutiny for making up stuff and placing herself in places she never was. 
You had mentioned earlier her lying about not receiving education when in all actuality she did get some formal education. That, and when it comes to her brother's murder in her autobiography, I Rigoberta Menchu, she placed herself present for her brother's murder. And wasn't that the case? No, not at all. She wasn't there and there's no evidence to prove her claims. In fact, all the evidence actually goes towards her never being there in the first place. Do you think this discredits her story or makes it any less impactful? This is a tough call. To me, you can't lie about things like being at your brother's murder scene. It makes you seem inauthentic and makes me question what else you may have lied about in your story. I can see your point, but she still went through horrific things growing up and that doesn't discredit her telling a story that was a typical of the average Guatemalan woman. You two pretty much summarize the whole debate that broke out around Rigoberta Manchu in the 1990s. Her critics, who are often on the right, picked on discrepancies in her story to denounce her as a fraud. Her defenders, who were often on the left, said that the larger story was true, that there was indeed a brutal counterinsurgency operation against critics of the Guatemalan regime in which hundreds of thousands were killed, most of them poor Native Americans like Ricoberta's family. And you couldn't just miss the forest for the trees. So this ties into larger political disputes. Democrats against Republicans? Right. In the 80s, the Reagan administration supported Guatemala's government, while Democrats in Congress criticized human rights violations. So people embraced or rejected Rigoberta's stories uh, based on their political affiliation. Such discrepancies don't discredit Rigoberta's overall story or make her experience any less valid. But they do make you ask the question and wonder if everything she's saying is 100% factual. For example, this might show my age a little bit. Okay, go ahead, let's hear it. Yeah, show us your age. As the resident old fault in the show, I'd love to hear that. Show us how old you are. Well, in the early 2000s. At which point I was already a college professor? There was a rapper named 50 Cent. You may have heard of him. He does a show called Power Now. But his whole aura and mystique was that he was shot nine times, right? Yes, I think I'm following you and see where you're going with this. Well, if he came out and said, well, I was only actually shot twice and one grazed my elbow, that would make us all question everything he said and is going to say in the future. Rigoberta lived and struggled as a Guatemalan woman, but she lied and now it's fair to question her statements and past in my opinion. As we said earlier, it also depends on where you stand politically on who was the rightful regime in Guatemala. Or even where you stand on larger debates on philosophy and truths. What's more important, the narrow factual truths or the larger more relative truths of oppression as experienced by the likes of Rigoberta Menchio? Is there such a thing as absolute truth? Should we embrace moral relativism? I think we need to get a regular MSNBC viewer and a member of Fox News Nation and just let the sparks fly. Oh yeah, we could even dress them like Mexican wrestlers with a mask and everything. That should be fun. That should be fun. Maybe not today though. Uh, back to Rigoberta Menchu. Regardless of what you and I think, she came up from practically nothing in a male-dominated society in Guatemala and won a Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, we jumped straight from her accounts of being targeted by right-wing death squads to Nobel Peace Prize. We should go into that more. We will have to cover that next. It's time for another song. More Guatemalan music. This time it's Peces e Iguanas by Bohemia Suburbana.
This was Peces e Iguanas, and you're listening to Your Grandma Rots on KBYS. I'm Arturo Flores. I'm Candy Thornton. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Today we are retracing the life of Rigoberta Menchu, a Native American from Guatemala, best known for opposing the right-wing dictatorship that ruled her country in the 1980s. Before our break, we explained how her family was decimated by government death squads. The particulars of her story came under fire, but there is no denying the horrors that went on in Central America during the Cold War. In nearby El Salvador, where there was a similar dictatorship, Archbishop Oscar Romero was shot by a death squad in broad daylight while serving mass, and no one was ever convicted. Wow, if the murder of an archbishop could go unpunished like that, there was little to protect a family like the Minshews. But as promised, let's discuss Miss Minshew's winning of the Nobel Peace Prize. Okay, sounds good to me. Where should we start? How about the work that got her recognized for the award? Well, the work that got her recognized was titled I, Rigoberta Menchu. The biography of her life, right? Correct. It detailed what life was like for the average Guatemalan woman and showed the struggle her people were in, living during a time of civil war. She won for her work on the biography? Not just that. The book brought attention to the Guatemalan Civil War. All over the globe, it was a topic of discussion among people. That is impressive to bring such a local issue to a global scale. As I mentioned earlier, this was a huge topic of discussion in the U.S. in the 80s, where the regimes backed by the U.S., like the one in Guatemala, were committing human rights abuses on a huge scale, and whether those violations were justified as part of a global war on communism. She helped put that issue on the front burner. It really is amazing to have someone far away reading what's going on in little old Guatemala and getting people to care, it's, it's a huge accomplishment, which is what she was recognized for with the prize. And this was well before social media. So for this small country to be talked about across the world is amazing. Great point. It's crazy to think how quickly news travels in modern times. Back then, it took more legwork. What else was she recognized for, or was that her 15 minutes of fame? Besides her book, she was also recognized for her activism as well as advocating for social justice, along with, of course, respecting the rights of indigenous people. A fascinating woman who really believed in what she was saying and cared a lot about her roots. Yes, I believe cultural identity is a huge part of who she is as a person. Is there a quote that you would say embodies Rigoberta Menchu? I would have to pick this quote here. I think it captures her personality and thoughts perfectly. Peace cannot exist without justice. Justice cannot exist without fairness. Fairness cannot exist without development. Development cannot exist without democracy. Democracy cannot exist without respect for the identity and worth of cultures and peoples. And our show cannot exist without musical interludes. So let's have another song to wrap up this segment. We'll stick with Guatemala music, but this time it's in English. Here is A Moment of Lucidity by Woodson.
Salut à tous. This was a moment of lucidity. Je m'appelle Philippe Chirin. And I'm Candy Thornton. And I'm Arturo Flores. You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks on KBYS, a show about famous women from centuries past. Today we retrace the life of Rigoberta Menchu, who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992 for championing the rights of indigenous people in Central America. So let's wrap the show up. What is she up to now in 2019? In 2011, which seems like centuries ago, she attempted to run for president of Guatemala. And? Well, she lost. Oh, did that end her career as an activist? Oh no, she is now 60 years old and still doing the things she loves, which is speaking to crowds about her story and how we should all be tolerant of each other. Still giving speeches at 60? Well, it's not that old. We're taping this show in September 2019, and currently the four leading contenders for the next presidential election are in the U.S. are Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump. And all of them are in their 70s. So if you can run for president of the U.S. at age 70, maybe you can give a speech at age 60. Yes, in fact, I believe she did not one not too long ago in California. She refused to do it at the university for some reason and held it at another venue, and it sold out. Well, this issue of the Cold War in Central America in the 80s may seem like old news, but it's still very much in the news. What do you mean? Well, the regimes in Guatemala and Salvador are still subpar, and there's still a huge issue of gun violence there, which in many ways is a legacy from the Civil War of the 80s. So as a result, many people from Central America are trying to flee. Typically, they make their way to Mexico and then to the U.S. to ask for asylum. I see. We're back to pretty political topics. Some Americans want to welcome these migrants as political refugees who flee violence for a better life in the U.S., especially since they are indirect victims of American political choices from the 80s. Right. Meanwhile, other Americans see them as economic migrants who are inventing stories of abuse just to have an excuse to get a visa into the U.S. The same controversies swirling around Rigoberta Menchu at the time. That's the thing about history. Somehow, all these shoes are still relevant today. They are. I'm curious to see how things will end up with Rigoberta Menchu. What a life. Quelle vie incroyable, en effet. Thank you and goodbye.